Perfect, perfect. Uh, and so here it is, can you answer the same session? Hopefully that, that has been resolved. Okay, so let's get into it. So one of the things for me is at any given time, please feel free to uh, ask questions, feel free to make a comment. Uh, if you so choose, feel free to unmute your microphone. You getting information and, and that dialoguing is what's most important. But while that's going on, let me share my screen with you all and uh, we can get into it. And again, I like to ask questions or make comments. And so therefore uh, feel free to answer those questions. And Sue. I would never think Okay, let me, I'm hearing some feedback from somewhere. So I just wanna make sure. Okay, I think I got it. All right, cool. Uh, so here's my question to you all. Um, and it's obvious, right? This is an obvious one and so it's all good. Uh, just feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so sorry, I'm hearing some feedback. Okay, so uh, what area is this in? What area is this in? It's right there, right? Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. But feel free to type in the chat or even just unmute your microphone and let me know what area is this photo in? First of all, can you all see? Can you see this? Can you see this? If you, if you can see it, type yes in the chat. Cool, all right, yes, you can. You're saying, when would... In Miami, absolutely, 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 right? Okay, and so one of the things I wanna also ask you is this, how would you define gentrification? What is your understanding of gentrification? If someone said to you, hey, what's gentrification? What answer would you give? You could type in the chat, but also feel free to unmute yourself. Um, but if you unmute yourself, please talk. I hear feedback. What, how would you define gentrification? Anybody? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I would say it's basically the taking, uh, taking away land and property from groups that may not be as fortunate or as educated to basically build a master plan, which is exactly what I saw happen in that area within the last... Um, 15 years or so. Okay, okay, really good answer, I like that. Marilyn types in the chat, when development in an underserved area takes place displacing the re residents. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Really good thoughts, really good thoughts. Uh, Lake Lakai said, Lake says, another group of people taking over the people who have been there over a long period of time. Uh, someone puts in over, over time, right? Or over town, especially, we know over time is experiencing some sense of gentrification as well, right? All really good answers, really good answers. Now, one of the things I, I and a little bit about me, forgot to kind of give you a little bit of context about myself. Um, so I've been working at Broward College for 12 and a half years. Uh, I started off as um, a professor, adjunct professor, then became a full-time professor in 2012, uh, teaching African-American history and American history. And then the last, several months I've become the interim associate dean of the criminal justice program here at Broward College, right? Uh, and for me, I like to look at things through a historical framework. I think it's very important to do that. And so when we're looking at gentrification, the term comes from the sociologist Ruth Glass from England. If you think about it, right, uh, gentrification comes from the word gentry. The word gentry was a British term that refers to those of the upper class, upper economic echelon. And so what Ruth Glass studied, he realized in England in the 60s that there were people who were leaving the upper class, right? And, or being a part of the upper class, and they were moving into these lower income working class neighborhoods. And when they're entering into these working class neighborhoods, then the value of the property in which they're buying immediately begins to shoot up, right? Okay. so. That's where we get the word gentrification from. Those of an upper class economically, right? They have more capital. They're moving into areas in which the property value was less. 
But as more of them are moving in, then the property value increases and that increasement, the increasement of the property value leads to the displacement of those who live there in the first place. Are y'all with me so far, right? So that's where we get this term gentrification uh, from, right? But now, here is the thing, Marbury giving some British examples of, of some areas for sure, right? Uh, so now here are some, some things to think about though. One of the things that you have to realize is before that there is this kind of sense of gentrification or urban renewal in some context, you have what is known as disinvestment, right? And so here you have it where these neighborhoods end up having uh, buildings that are in decay and in disrepair. And then it's at these moments that it becomes easier to gentrify these neighborhoods or easier to cause for there to be urban renewal in these neighborhoods. And let's give like a real Miami example. So Little Haiti, right? Um, and if you take a look at this particular uh, quote from this article, gentrification is pushing Haitians out of Miami's Little Haiti. Uh, the person who lives here and uh, owns a business in my Little Haiti said this, they also never cleaned here. In the last five or six years, the city would never clean up the streets. Now, so this is like, in other words, before there was a sense and start of gentrification, there was no cleaning of the streets on a regular basis based on the city, right? So now, if an area is in disrepair, part of the reason why the disrepair is maintained is because the city is not actively doing anything to address the disrepair while the, the residents remain primarily minorities. But when gentrification happens, something interesting occurs. So she says, now they come and clean at night and spray mosquitoes too, right? So now, cis truck is another excellent example, right? Okay. So now, one of the things that's very important for you to understand is that gentrification or any kind of urban renewal really works well with the fact that we in America have lived in a very segregated society. Now, quite often when we look at segregation, we look at it the way it's mentioned sometimes is almost as if it was a mutual segregation, but it wasn't mutual. It wasn't like whites and blacks decided with equal power, hey, you guys stay over here and we'll stay over here, right? You had individuals who were arbiting the segregation. You had those who were the, really the segregators and the segregated, right? When we're looking at segregation, it's so important that you understand that it's not a mutual segregation that's agreed upon with equal power. You have segregators, right? And then you have those who was, excuse me, uh, can you mute yourself, please, for, the, for that, if, unless it's dealing with people. And then those who are segregated, right? Okay. So this is really spelled out brilliantly in Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. So we have things like redlining, right, where the Federal Housing Administration does a color code of neighborhoods, and that those that were color coded in red were not privy to bank loans for housing, right, federal housing loans and the like and they were deemed as the lowest of the low. You have blockbusting where realtors would take advantage of, of white fear of black invasion, if you will, of a neighborhood. So they would go and tell whites, hey, blacks are moving in. Whites would be afraid, sell their homes at a depressed value. And then the realtor or someone will buy that property and then sell it to black homeowners at a much higher uh, price and the value in and of itself, right? Uh, which definitely put blacks in an economic disadvantage. And then you had white flight. So I'm from Miami and my parents were like the second black family on a particular block in 1983. And by the time I was, when I was born, by the time I was four, everyone in my block was black or Latin, but primarily black. That is white flight, right? That fear of black invasion. So now there's going to be a connection I'm going to make momentarily to how this impacts the education system. And what I define as intellectual gentrification. I just want you to build, I just want to build the groundwork. Right? Okay. So then when gentrification happens, right? And so here you have it where there's segregation. And the segregation in and of itself, where you have whites being the segregators and blacks being the segregated, suggests a hierarchy construct, right? So now when you have these predominantly black and or Latin neighborhoods, and then whites who are from the gentry are moving in. One of the dynamics that shifts is also police presence. So there's an increase in 311 calls and there's an increase in 911 calls, right? So 311 calls are those calls that are not emergency related, 
uh, but they're like more noise disturbance. I remember reading an article about an area in DC where it was predominantly black and people would pay, play African drums in the park on Sundays. No one had an issue with it. That's how it was in the neighborhood. Then when gentrification happened, all of a sudden, though that playing of the drums was deemed as a, nerve, a noise disturbance. So the behavior and the activity that was deemed as acceptable by the neighborhood at one point in time was deemed therefore no longer acceptable by the neighborhood uh, when other people from the gentry start moving in. Police presence also comes more properly, right? It's not as if the neighborhood had no police presence, but they didn't have a typical standard police presence just to make sure the perimeter is okay. But now all of a sudden more police presence and the police presence is coming in more promptly, right? These distinctions leads to black folk or Latin folk or minorities living in these neighborhoods where when they lived there and they were the majority and it was uh, free gentrification. Sale. Pre gentrification, you had a situation where there wasn't as much police presence or it wasn't prompt. Neighborhoods were not being cleaned on a regular basis. Property values were deemed as low, right? And there was no interest in the area. As soon as others who don't look like the individuals uh, live, living there start moving in, police presence is more prompt. Neighborhoods are more interested in cleaning these particular areas. Um, at property value increases and the gamut, right? And so it leads to those living in these neighborhoods to feel isolated, devalued, and then eventually, because of the new value of the property, they end up being displaced. Those three components, I want you to think about that as it relates to the classroom. Quite often, minority students enter into the classroom feeling isolated, devalued, and then eventually they may end up in a space of suspension or may end up not graduating and the like, and therefore eventually they end up being displaced from the environment, right? So now we're looking at it from a neighborhood standpoint. Let's go beyond that now and look at it from within the context of intellectual gentrification, right? And again, if you have any questions or any comments or anything, um, please let, let, it, let me know, right? And so here's the thing, mirror, mirror on the board, not merely on the wall, on the board, right? A classroom is a reflection of a society, right? And if we're honest about it, the reason why gentrification happens is because of a history that suggests that people of color are of less value, right? And if that is the case, and if we're not addressing that when we talk about gentrification, because what typically looks, is looked at is, well, the neighborhood has improved and look at the businesses that are thriving here and the income that is coming in, right? And the level of displacement of people or the fact that this neighborhood did not receive this kind of care or love prior to gentrification is not being addressed. And the same thing is true when it comes to education. Quite often, I know you've been in these meetings where there's been this the, the dreaded term that is used as achievement gap, right? And this conversation of, well, why is it that students of color are not performing as well as their white counterparts? And I'm sure you, you are tired of some of the discussion had in the meeting because people are saying, well, clearly there's a problem. Well, yes, there's a problem, but how are you addressing the problem? Are you really getting to the root of the problem, right? And so here's what I'm saying to you all. Gentrification is an invasion of the gentry, right? They are moving into the neighborhood and therefore it is suggested <laughs> that people of color are not of value. Um, and the same thing can be said true, true of many classrooms and school systems in America, right? And so this is what we're looking at when it comes to intellectual gentrification. The question we have to ask is, are there moments in which our students feel isolated, devalued, and then eventually displaced, right? The first thing to really take into consideration is that we have to be honest about America and our, our, our morning speaker was amazing, right? Mayor Pagat talks about the fact that we in America had experienced slavery for 246 years. But in experiencing slavery for 246 years, there had to be some sense of justifying it, right? Like, how do you justify dehumanizing a people? How do you justify enslaving a people for 246 years? 
rooted in that justification is a notion of intellectual inferiority. So what do we find? In the 18th century, Carl Linnaeus creates this taxonomy when it comes to the races. And what he says of the Europeans, right, is that they were very smart and inventive. Now, here's what's interesting. When we often mention whites, we often say the term Caucasian, but Anglo-Saxons are not people of the Caucasus mountain. But yet the Caucasus mountains were seen as the most beautiful mountain. So even the name Caucasian itself is speaking to uh, a connection to an assumption of beauty, right? Now here it is where Europeans who are deemed eventually as Caucasians are seen as very smart and inventive according to Linnaeus. But when he describes the Africans, they're seen as lazy and slow, unintellectual. It makes it easier to dehumanize them, right? Because Aristotle says that the very basis of what makes us human is thought, right? And so if, we're, if you are therefore not deemed as intelligent or smart, then it, that does become a question, the assumption was, of one's humanity. So, so how do we justify the enslavement of Africans? Well, we dehumanize them. And how do we dehumanize them? By suggesting that they're not like others. They are less intellectually inclined and therefore they are more privy to be a part of physical manual labor, right? Okay. One example of this is the, the story of Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was um, the second woman in American history to publish a book of poetry. She was a teenager, 17 going on 18, a first black woman to publish a book of poetry. Uh, and yet her slave masters had wanted for her to, to face a trial, if you will, to determine whether or not she had written the book because she knew that many whites would doubt that she, this young African girl, had written this book. One of the individuals who doubted her was Thomas Jefferson, right? Jefferson, the third president of the, uh, of the United States, the first secretary of state, uh, the lead author of the Declaration of Independence. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Uh, so the lead, the lead author of the Declaration of Independence, right? Um, he is someone who is one of the individuals that says, hey, I don't think she wrote that, right? Many people thought she was incapable of writing it simply because she was Black and enslaved, right? And so there was this notion of lack of Black intellectual um, capability and ability, right? Uh, I think about this. So uh, one of the individuals who was really prominent was Booker T. Washington. Um, and he has this quote, the wisest among my race understand that the agitation of questions of racial equality is the extremist folly, folly right? And so that thinking where, where Booker T. Washington was more so focused on um, you know, education around agriculture and education around domestic work was appealing to white philanthropists. This is the reason why Booker T. Washington was well a lot more uh, promoted and propped up than W.E.B. Du Bois, his counterpart, right? Many white philanthropists like Carnegie, who's featured in this photo, were giving Tuskegee money, right? They loved that message of, yes, teach Blacks how to farm and how to be domestic workers, but don't teach them other things. And we know this to be the case because when a Black student had written one of these white philanthropists about the things that she was learning in Tuskegee, and one of the things she referenced was that she's learning literature, right? That individual contacted Booker T. Washington and was very upset and said, I am not spending my money for you to teach them literature. They are not of a mature mind, right? Yes, teach them about being a farmer. That's what I'm paying you all to do but I'm not paying you all to do more than that. And what does it suggest? Again, that even post-slavery, there was a mindset that Blacks were less intelligent. That way of thinking, both consciously and subconsciously, entered into academic settings, right? But we know that race does not determine one's intellectual ability. This is a photo of Anna Julia Cooper. Uh, one of the first Black women to get a PhD, and she was an amazing educator. And in 1899, she was a teacher in M Street in Washington, D.C., 
where her black students were actually outperforming her white students in the DC area. Speaking to the proof that race cool to prevent you from excelling academically. The question is though, is that way of thinking that Anna Julia Cooper bestowed upon her class, does that exist in a lot of other areas? And what helps prevent that from existing, again, is this reality. Segregated bodies often lead to segregated ideas, right? I want you to think about this critically, right? If I were to name a school, for example, Dillard High School, Ely High School, you would already in your mind know exactly the racial demographics of that school. And you would know that it's different than Western High School. Why is that the case, right? We know though that segregated neighborhoods, especially when we add financial resources around that, leads to segregated schools. And if we have it where 40% of black children, according to one book, the teacher was specifically was the book, are in schools where 90% of the kids are living below the poverty line, it leads to a particular thought that maybe I'm the problem, right? Why is it that when I'm in a particular school that where people look like me or in neighborhoods where people look like me, why is there a different economic reality when it comes to the other schools? Why is it that in schools that I attend that these schools are deemed as underserved schools? Why is it that these are deemed as underperforming schools? What does it say about me, right? So for interesting study uh, or thing happened in Raleigh, North Carolina some years ago, they recognized that students and black students and Latin students were not performing as well as white students in, when it came to standardized testing. And so what they decided to do is they decided, all right, we need to integrate our schools uh, more than we've been doing. And so what we're going to do is therefore have it where um, you have no school is going to have more than 40% of anything, more than 40% higher income, more than 40% white, more than 40% black and Latin. We're going to integrate the schools. And within several years, what they found is that the test scores began evening out. However, the courts made them go away from that system because parents were complaining and saying it was unfair. Mainly white parents were complaining and saying it was unfair, right? Um, because they didn't want to have to bust their, their kids to these various schools outside of their neighborhoods. The point being that in this New York Times article, magazine article, the Cohanna Jones had referenced um, that there was a school in Alabama in which white parents wanted them to create a new school district in large part because they were uncomfortable with the amount of black children that began going to the schools in that particular county. And by creating this new school district, they thought they could create schools that would be in their favor from a racial demographic, right? All of these things, again, is seeping into the mind of difference. The other thing that needs to be taken into consideration is this, um, and I'm blitzing through this just because our time is abbreviated and I wanna give you all the time to ask me questions and share any comments you would like. Um, you know, I teach African-American history at the college level and my college students didn't know who Toni Morrison was. And I thought to myself, Toni Morrison wrote Beloved. Beloved in 2006 was deemed by the New York Times as the seminal and best uh, novel and most important novel in America in the last 25 years, right? And yet my students, predominantly black students who attended predominantly black schools, whether it be Broward County schools and some of them attended Miami Bay County schools, I never heard who Toni Morrison in the last session when we talked about is how interesting it is that when we look at black folk who are referenced in the public domain it's often those of the sports right world or those in the entertainment world but what does that say that the my students didn't know Toni morrison was that means that in their english classes in their literature classes she was not being brought up black authors were not being brought up which leads to the question in, in science classes are black scientists being brought up in, in math classes are the African contributions being brought up, right? So for so many in school, they're not seeing contributors who look like them being brought up in essence, right? And that- <laughs> Hello? Yes. I have no idea why this- It's pretty much just me. 
I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Can you mute yourself, please? Whoever background that is. Okay, thank you. Um, and so here it is, right? Where the, many of them are not being featured of students where students can say, look, I see this author, I see this contributor who looks like me, right? Uh, and so one of the things that needs to be taken into consideration is how this is this, this class should ideally break apart what George DeGruy says is post-traumatic slave syndrome. But in many instances, the classroom becomes an extension of it. Uh, DeGruy de de defines it as this, post-traumatic slave syndrome is a condition that exists when a population has experienced multi-generational trauma resulting from centuries of slavery and continues to experience oppression and institutionalized racism today. Added to this condition is a belief, real or imagined, that the benefits of the society in which they live are not accessible to them. A class should disrupt post-traumatic slave syndrome. But if a class is just mirroring the stereotype that black and brown folk are intellectually inferior and confirming that stereotype, it is not disrupting post-traumatic slave syndrome, it is continuing post-traumatic slave syndrome. And this is the reason why you see this issue around identity threat. And in particular, when it comes to the shifting of students, right? So in the book, uh, um, Bandwidth Recovery, it's quoted as saying the following, one strategy now majority and poor students use sometimes unconsciously to decrease identity threat is to base their self-esteem on domains in which they have failed or in which society expects them to fail. They change their self-concept so that a particular domain, e.g. academic performance, is no longer the basis of self-esteem, right? So if the thought is, well, whether or not you perform well in school is the determinant of whether or not you can feel good about yourself, and clearly it's believed that I can't do well in school, I'm therefore no longer going to base my self-esteem on how I do in the classroom, right? And so if you're ever seeing that, well, yes, there's, there's a lot of aspects that go around this person's understanding of class, right? And so all of this leads to students feeling isolated, devalued, and then eventually displaced. There's already a belief that I'm not of value. People and kids who look like me often end up in economically disadvantaged spaces. Teachers may not teach to us because they may, well, because they may believe that we don't know the content or won't know the content. Um, schools where I am the majority end up having lesser resources or end up being deemed as underserved or underperforming. Uh, I end up, people who look like me end up being suspended more frequently. Uh, this, we're told that we don't succeed as much. And then eventually it's going to lead to my displacement, right? And that is intellectual gentrification. The question is, how do we get to a place of intellectual development, right? And so these are strategies I've employed that I'll share with you all. Uh, and then I would like to hear from you. Uh, I would recommend that you read, if you haven't already, a book by Paulo Freire called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And in that book, he talks about the banking system of education, right? This idea of just, just really inputting a bunch of information in students, but then expecting for them to regurgitate that information and there's no dialogue, right? There's no interaction between the teacher and the student. And he says, no true learning can come from that. And so for me, in my classes, I have what I call a potluck approach, right? Um, there is no I and them, there is us, right? There is no me and then y'all, there is us. I am not the only educator in the room. I empower my students to see themselves as educators and I empower them by also letting them know that not only are they my students, yes, but I also am a student of them because of theirs, because I can learn from them as well. Here's what I know in regards to my experiences with creating and fostering an intellectually development uh, centered and community centered uh, environment. Number one, knowing a student's name is important. It creates an intimacy and a connection. Some colleagues of mine and I did a study at, at the college and one of the questions we posed was if it was important for a professor to know a student's name. Now, granted, there's a greater level of expectation 
on behalf of teachers in K through 12 for you to know your students' names. So then for you, it might be different where the question becomes, how quickly do you know your students' names? The sooner you know your students' names, the sooner the connection can be made because 90% of the survey respondents said, yes, when a professor knows my name, it fosters a sense of connection, right? The other thing is this, uh, I believe in a holistic form of teaching and approach. So data suggests that when students go to the office for college professors more often, they're more likely to succeed. And I stole this from a colleague and I implemented this idea in my class where I wanted for students to know where my office is and to be comfortable in knowing where my office is. And so what I did, and again, I learned this from a colleague of mine, is I instituted an office selfie as a mini assignment, right? So students would have to go to my office, find it, and then take a selfie in front of it so I know they know where my office is, and then encourages them to come see me. The other thing is verbiage is important. So in for office hours, yes, I would say, here's my office hours, but I will also say, hey guys, I have Mental Health Mondays, where you can come to my office and talk about anything you want to that is impacting your life beyond the classroom. And it doesn't have to be limited to Mondays, but I want you to know that I'm here beyond just being your educator. I'm here to help you walk you through certain things. And if you need therapy, mental health therapy, we have resources at the college and I will therefore connect you to those resources, right? I would connect with them with the Remind app. I would create one-on-ones with them because I want them to know that I'm here for their whole being. And once students see that you care about their whole essence and their being, they're more invested in their educational experience. The other thing that is really key is what I call perception correction. And how I define perception correction is this, getting students to perceive that they have the tools to succeed in the classroom and in life rather than perceive that failure is imminent, right? That is really unbelievably important that you do that. Perception correction, right, is unbelievably important. Then building a community. And so here's some photos I took of, of my classes from times past, um, and I would build a sense of community so that way my classroom is always buzzing with activity and conversation, right? One of the things that I do is I form groups for the entire semester, right? I would recommend that you form groups for the entire quarters, right? Why? Because students can utilize these groups to remind each other about assignments that are due, can help each other have a deeper understanding of assignments and in-class activities. But I don't randomly just assign them the groups. I would give them personality tests based upon the personality test scores as well as based upon some other factors, I then form groups around that. And the first day when they come back on the second day of class and I put them in their groups, because students are very shy and especially when they don't know each other, I give them prompts like, what's your food moment, which is your favorite food and who in your family is crazy. Like we make it really fun to get the students talking. Then when it came to readings, I will put them in their groups and they would have what I call coffee talk, right? Where they get a chance to get to know each other uh, but then talk about the reading together. Uh, and I make sure that the group work that I do assign them is not just group work for group work's sake, but that it's it's meaningful and we create accountability. I, I've also taken my students to the movies. Uh, over a hundred of us saw 12 Years a Slave. It's not invited students from all of my classes and their family and friends and like 130 of us, I believe it was, ended up going to, to see 12 Years a Slave, right? Um, we also would end the semester without a, with a, with a potluck and so all of these things create a sense of community. My assignments were also very intentional. So I want to say, hey, group, talk about this uh, event that happened before. But no, I would have them form as a news organization, if you will, right? Um, and, and forming as a news organization, they would therefore use social media. They would use a panel a la you know, Anderson Cooper 360, all of that. Uh, in their group lectures, I wouldn't say, hey guys, you're presenting. I would say, no, this is a group lecture where you are professors. They would address each other as professors and they would dress up as professors, empowering them to be educators. So if you look at the photo on the bottom, these are some of my students, uh, the day that they presented. Look how, how wonderful and amazing and handsome these young brothers look. And I shared it with my social media with their permission, of course. And then when I got so much love from social media, I then shared it with them, hey y'all, this is what my friends on Facebook were saying about how you guys were dressed and how proud I am of you. And that 
gave them a boost of morality, right? And the idea of pride in their work. I named them and titled them professors, right? So that is definitely very important. The other thing it, to take into consideration is you have to show students on a regular basis the connection of what you are teaching them, connecting that to the payoff financially. Uh, education can lead to economic and income growth, right? When students can make that connection, that is definitely going to be important and key. Tap into your network, right? And again, I'm kind of going through this quickly so it can get to questions and comments. I know our time is short. Tapping into your network. So uh, I wanted for my young black woman students to connect with the black woman professor, professionals at the college. I wanted them to have a real conversation around what it means to be a black woman and how to navigate this world and how to get to a place of success. So I got my friends who are deans, I got my friends who are professors, I got my friends who worked in student services, I got my friends who were leading the library department, right? I got them, right, to be a part of this wonderful dialogue and conversation in order to empower my students, right? Uh, so tapping into your network is going to be key. And then I'll, I'll end on this one with one more slide and then, you know, take questions and comments. Um, the power of them seeing themselves uh, in, in this is of utmost importance, right? Um, and so here's what this particular person said. Um, I look up to Patricia Bath and find her to be very inspirational because there are plenty of times where I get those feelings and thoughts that I'm Black, I won't be able to become a doctor, or maybe I'm not smart enough to be the doctor I want to be. Uh, after reading about Bath and seeing that she was the first African-American female uh, doctor to receive a medical patent and invent something that is now used today to help people, that is inspiring, right? She had to see herself. And it's so important that you affirm your students and you give them words of affirmation. And that is empowerful, letting them know that they are more than enough. And so now uh, let's dialogue. Uh, please feel free to unmute your microphone or type in the chat any questions or comments that you may have, right? And so let us try to solve some things. I know we have a short period of time, but I would love to hear questions or comments. Uh, and SAW for me is an acronym, it's to stimulate, right? Stimulate thought, observe the thoughts that are being shared, locate solutions and problem, verify those are indeed solutions or problems, and then execute a game plan. So I know it's a lot, but time is short, but I wanted to share this with you all and I'll answer any questions or comments you all may have. Feel free to also, you know, utilize the chat as well if you so choose. Questions, comments. I just want to say that this was probably one of the more powerful presentations, and I wish this could go on for, for even longer because I've been really truly enjoyed the um, the dialogue and listening to you. I can tell that you know there's so much passion there. So I just wanted to just say thank you for that. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, really, really. And I kind of rushed to just because it's so much, but I know the time is short. Um, and I wanted to give you all an opportunity to, um, you know, share and ask questions if you so choose. And so any, you know, comments or thoughts, um, you know, feel free definitely to share and, and ask at this moment in time. Yeah, this is typically a three hour kind of conversation, to be honest with you. It is, but I'm like, ah, oh, let me just kind of compress it and then, um, you know, get into it. But any comments or questions you all might have, I'll be more than happy to answer um, and then speak with you all about it. I have a question. How are you doing, Rudy? Hey. Um, <laughs> how are you? Nice to see you. Um, quick question. Um, I'm actually working at the center this school year in the early childhood program. And I have um, a lot of my students who are moving on and who are moving forward. Um, and it's actually in um, Lauderhill area. So I have a student who is on the spectrum, on the autism mm -hmm. spectrum, but he's very intelligent. I mean, the kid is reading at the third grade level. He's gifted, if you ask me. And right. so the mom is very, very nervous regarding um, his own school, which mm -hmm. is um, and not a, um, not a great um, area, you could say. 
Right. And also she's just wondering, you know, what are some of the other options were? So are you finding that out with a lot of the students that you have worked with? Um, obviously, I know you're very, um, you know, very knowledgeable in this area where it's almost like they hit like a ceiling, so to speak. And so it's hard to sort of tap into their full potential due to um, the neighborhood or due to where they're li- they live and how to, um, you know, find a solution to that problem. Absolutely. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, and I have a, a four-year-old, he'll be five, um, and, and I'll be vulnerable with you all. He's very hyperactive, right? It's a little too early for a full diagnosis of, of anything concretely, um, but he also, too, is, is someone who he's about to be five, and he reads on a third grade level as well, right? And so there's some connection there. And so one of the things that it becomes challenging as a parent, as a Black parent especially, is to find the right school environment, in part because when Black children or minority children are on the spectrum, um, not just whether it comes to autism, but maybe anything else, uh, or there's this assumption of behavior issues or behavior problems, it is deemed quite often as that behavior problems rather than a diagnosis that is needed, right? And so what it's, it's and paramount is for that child to have a, an educator that cares, okay? Especially when, if there are moments where the child, whether it be due to hyperactivity or some other aspects, has some challenges that might be deemed behavioral, that that teacher is not seeing that as a referendum on that child, but more so taking in the context, hey, this child might be experiencing this thing, but these child, this child clearly has immense capabilities, right? I think it's really important that schools in particular, um, Broward County schools, any you know, public school system schools, start really thinking about how do we cultivate a culture, a true culture of compassion and student success. And the reason why that's important is because too often children are dependent upon that one magical teacher that they will not be able to experience at another juncture, right? And that's problematic when someone's educational experience is predicated upon whether or not they get that great teacher, right? And so one of the things I think educators should think about really, and and teachers empower themselves to have this dialogue, is what does it look like to have a really great culture of compassion and also excellent teaching, right? Because those are two different things. You You could be the most caring person imaginable, but not be a great teacher. But then on the flip side, you could be um, a person that is an amazing teacher or has ability, but not be caring. And students need both, right? And cultivating that culture around that is going to be so important. Uh, And so for me, I did find a school personally that was African-centered, New Akabulan, in the Lada Hill area, that was, that is a somewhat private school, if you will. Um, but it's African centered and, and my kid is around teachers and students of people who look like him and they don't limit his capabilities and they empower him, right? And I'm not saying one kid has to go to that school. I'm saying that that kind of culture of true compassion and excellent teaching needs to be built in various schools because then that's when you're gonna find more or different narrative around the schools that are offered in our county and elsewhere. Any other comments, um, questions that you all, you know, might might have? Um, and so one of the things in, in the comment about building, you know, uh, community, and I appreciate the comments. Um, and so Lashana, let me kind of address that too. So it's so important to build community. Um, I, to this day, and I don't say this from a standpoint of braggadocia, um, get a lot of requests for letters of recommendation. <laughs> um, and I get a lot of students to come see me years after they've taken me. And I'm sure many of you have that experience. Um, and I remember one student who went on to Columbia University just emailing me one saying, um, of the educators made a difference in my life and you were one of them. Um, and that I felt great about it. it said that she was able to get world-class education at Broward College and that it was no different in regards to um, expectation or level of excellence, but clearly the compassion I would imagine is different than when she went on to Columbia, right? 
And the thing that um, I say all that is because it's rooted in a building of community. When students feel connected to you, they will do better. I remember one time um, there was a group lecture and they didn't do well, a particular group. And I got on them in love, but I got on them. And that's the thing, if I didn't have that relationship with them, I can't get on them, right? It's hard to generate true expectations if you don't have that connection with the students. When you have that connection with the students, it gives you more license to give them more honest critique, right? And them not feel utterly offended because you're coming in love and you know that you, they, they know that you care about them. And the student had written me a note saying, I apologize for our group presentation. I apologize for my part in it. And I feel so disappointed because we disappointed you. You are a man in which I have faith in and trust in and the disappointment that is disappointing, right? That kind of community, it, so in other words, her desire to strive in part was because of the connection to, to me. She knew I cared about her. There's another student who one time said in a final paper in regards to the class, as a black woman, I have never felt so seen before because we covered content that speaks to that. We openly talked about things that impacted the black woman and impacted people of color. Students want to be seen and in them being seen, that is what is going to empower them, right? Uh, and so community is foundational to that. Community is foundational to that. So here's something else I want you to be mindful of. And again, um, I can stay back a little bit longer for any comments you all may have, but I want for you to know and leave with this, that you have the power. Education has the power to change the trajectory of not only a person, but their descendants, right? What we learn can generate wealth for us, both financially and also intellectually and empower those who come after us. You think about this for a moment. There could be a child in your class who comes from an economically disadvantaged situation. You empower them to go on to be an adult with a profession, generate some revenue, and then they teach their children some of the things that they've learned and experienced. And that changes the economic trajectory of that entire bloodline. You have the power to do that. There is a connection between education and incarceration. Therefore, the more educated that you are, the lo less likely you are to be incarcerated. Data shows there's a linkage. You have the power to prevent some individuals from facing incarceration. You have the power to prevent some individuals from facing an early death due to violence. You have the power to change a community. I'm reminded by Dr. Inez Beverly Prosser's headstone, where she says, how many hopes lie buried here, but you as educator can have your students live their hopes rather than die without them being realized. I want you to know you have the power to intellectually develop and work against intellectual gentrification. Uh, it's been great to be in your presence. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'll stay back for a few minutes, um, but this is wonderful and thank you so much for this opportunity to connect with you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you all.